Ask a Foolish Question by Robert Sheckley. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dan Gerzinski. Ask a Foolish Question by Robert Sheckley. It is well established now that the way you put a question often determines not only the answer you'll get, but the type of answer possible. So a mechanical answerer, geared to produce the ultimate revelations in reference to anything you want to know, might have unsuspected limitations. Answerer was built to last as long as was necessary, which was quite long, as some races judge time, and not long at all, according to others. But to answerer, it was just long enough. As to size, answerer was large to some and small to others. He could be viewed as complex, although some believed that he was really very simple. Answerer knew that he was as he should be, above and beyond all else. He was the answerer. He knew. Of the race that built him, the less said the better. They also knew, and never said whether they found the knowledge pleasant. They built Answerer as a service to less sophisticated races, and departed in a unique manner. Where they went, only Answerer knows, because Answerer knows everything. Upon his planet, circling his sun, Answerer sat. Duration continued, long as some judge duration, short as others judge it, but as it should be to Answerer. Within him were the answers. He knew the nature of things, and why things are as they are, and what they are, and what it all means. Answerer could answer anything, provided it was a legitimate question. And he wanted to. He was eager to. How else should an answerer be? What else should an answerer do? So he waited for creatures to come and ask. "'How do you feel, sir?' Moran asked, floating gently over to the old man. "'Better,' Lingman said, trying to smile. No weight was a vast relief. Even though Moran had expended an enormous amount of fuel getting into space under minimum acceleration, Lingman's feeble heart hadn't liked it. Lingman's heart had balked and sulked, pounded angrily against the brittle ribcase, hesitated and sped up. It seemed for a time as though Lingman's heart was going to stop out of sheer peak. But no weight was a vast relief, and the feeble heart was going again. Moran had no such problems. His strong body was built for strain and stress. He wouldn't experience them on this trip, not if he expected old Lingman to live. "'I'm going to live,' Lingman muttered in an answer to the unspoken question. "'Long enough to find out.' Moran touched the controls, and the ship slipped into subspace like an eel into oil. "'We'll find out,' Moran murmured. He helped the old man unstrap himself. "'We're going to find the answerer.' Lingman nodded at his young partner. They had been reassuring themselves for years. Originally, it had been Lingman's project. Then Moran, graduating from Caltech, had joined him. Together, they had traced the rumors across the solar system, the legends of an ancient humanoid race who had known the answer to all things, and would built Answerer, and departed. Think of it, Moran said, the answer to everything. A physicist, Moran had many questions to ask Answerer. The expanding universe, the binding force of atomic nuclei, novae and supernovae, planetary formation, redshift, relativity, and a thousand others. Yes, Lingman said. He pulled himself to the vision plate and looked out on the bleak prairie of the illusory subspace. He was a biologist and an old man. He had two questions. What is life? What is death? 
after a particularly long period of hunting purple leck and his friends gathered to talk purple always ran thin in the neighborhood of multiple cluster stars why no one knew so talk was definitely in order do you know leck said i think i'll hunt up this answerer leck spoke the oligrat language now the language of imminent decision why ilim asked him in the vest tongue light banter why do you want to know things isn't the job of gathering purple enough for you no leck said still speaking the language of imminent decision it is not the great job of leck and his kind was the gathering of purple they found purple embedded in many parts of the fabric of space minute quantities of it slowly they were building a huge mound of it what the mound was for no one knew i suppose you'll ask him what purple is ilim asked pushing a star out of his way and lying down i will leck said we have continued in ignorance too long we must know the true nature of purple and its meaning in the scheme of things we must know why it governs our lives for this speech leck switched to ilgret the language of incipient knowledge ilm and the others didn't argue even in the tongue of arguments they knew that the knowledge was important ever since the dawn of time leck ilm and the others had gathered purple now it was time to know the ultimate answers to the universe what purple was and what the mound was for and of course there was the answerer to tell them everyone had heard of the answerer built by a race not unlike themselves now long departed will you ask him anything else ilum asked leck i don't know leck said perhaps i'll ask about the stars there's really nothing else important since leck and his brothers had lived since the dawn of time they didn't consider death and since their numbers were always the same they didn't consider the question of life but purple and the mound i go leck shouted in the vernacular of decision to fact good fortune his brothers shouted back in the jargon of greatest friendship leck strode off leaping from star to star alone on his little planet answerer sat waiting for the questioners occasionally he mumbled the answers to himself this was his privilege he knew but he waited and the time was neither too long nor too short for any of the creatures of space to come and ask there were eighteen of them gathered in one place i invoke the rule of eighteen cried one and another appeared who had never before been born by the rule of eighteen we must go to the answerer one cried our lives are governed by the rule of eighteen where there are eighteen there will be nineteen why is this so no one could answer where am i asked the newborn nineteenth one took him aside for instruction that left seventeen a stable number and we must find out cried another why all places are different although there is no distance that was the problem one is here then one is there just like that no movement no reason and yet without moving one is in another place the stars are cold one cried why we must go to the answerer for they had heard the legends knew the tales once there was a race a good deal like us and they knew and they told answerer then they departed to where there is no place but much distance how do we get there the newborn nineteenth cried filled now with knowledge we go and eighteen of them vanished one was left moodily he stared at the tremendous spread of an icy star then he too vanished those old legends are true moran gasped there it is they had come out of subspace at the place the legends told of and before them was a star unlike any other star moran invented a classification for it but it didn't matter there was no other like it 
swinging around the star was a planet, and this too was unlike any other planet. Moran invented reasons, but they didn't matter. This planet was the only one. "'Strap yourself in, sir,' Moran said. "'I'll land as gently as I can.' Lek came to Answerer, striding swiftly from star to star. He lifted Answerer in his hand and looked at him. "'So you are Answerer,' he said. "'Yes,' Answerer said. "'Then tell me,' Lek said, settling himself comfortably in a gap between the stars. "'Tell me what I am.' A partiality, Answerer said, an indication. Come now, Lek muttered, his pride hurt. You can do better than that. Now then, the purpose of my kind is to gather purple, and to build a mound of it. Can you tell me the real meaning of this? Your question is without meaning, Answerer said. He knew what purple actually was, and what the mound was for but the explanation was concealed in a greater explanation. Without this, Lek's question was inexplicable, and Lek had failed to ask the real question. Lek asked other questions, and Answerer was unable to answer them. Lek viewed things through his specialized eyes, extracted a part of the truth, and refused to see more. How to tell a blind man the sensation of green? Answerer didn't try. He wasn't supposed to. Finally, Lek emitted a scornful laugh. One of his little stepping stones flared at the sound, then faded back to its usual intensity. Lek departed, striding swiftly across the stars. Answerer knew, but he had to be asked the proper questions first. He pondered this limitation, gazing at the stars which were neither large nor small, but exactly the right size. The proper questions. The race which built Answerer should have taken that into account, Answerer thought. They should have made some allowance for semantic nonsense, allowed him to attempt an unraveling. Answerer contented himself with muttering the answers to himself. Eighteen creatures came to Answerer, neither walking nor flying, but simply appearing. Shivering in the cold glare of the stars, they gazed up at the massiveness of Answerer. "'If there is no distance,' one asked, "'then how can things be in other places?' Answerer knew what distance was, and what places were, but he couldn't answer the question. There was distance, but not as these creatures saw it. And there were places, but in different fashion from that which the creatures expected." "'Rephrase the question,' Answerer said hopefully. "'Why are we short here?' one asked, "'and long over there. "'Why are we fat over there and short here? "'Why are the stars cold?' "'Answerer knew all things. "'He knew why stars were cold, "'but he couldn't explain it in terms of stars or coldness. "'Why?' another asked. "'Is there a rule of eighteen? Why, when eighteen gather, is another produced? But, of course, the answer was part of another greater question which hadn't been asked. Another was produced by the rule of eighteen, and the nineteen creatures vanished. Answerer mumbled the right questions to himself and answered them. "'We made it,' Moran said. "'Well, well,' he patted Lingman on the shoulder lightly, because Lingman might fall apart. The old biologist was tired. His face was sunken, yellow, lined. Already the mark of the skull was showing in his prominent yellow teeth, his small flat nose, his exposed cheekbones. The matrix was showing through. Let's get on, Lingman said. He didn't want to waste any time. He didn't have any time to waste. Helmeted, they walked along the little path. Not so fast, Lingman murmured. Right, Moran said. They walked together along the dark path of the planet that was different from all other planets, soaring alone around a sun different from all other suns. Up here, Moran said. The legends were explicit. 
a path leading to stone steps stone steps to a courtyard and then the answerer to them answerer looked like a white screen set in a wall to their eyes answerer was very simple lingman clasped his shaking hands together this was the culmination of a lifetime's work financing arguing ferreting bits of legend ending here now remember he said to moran we will be shocked the truth will be like nothing we have imagined i'm ready moran said his eyes rapturous very well answerer lingman said in his thin little voice what is life a voice spoke in their heads the question has no meaning by life the questioner is referring to a partial phenomenon inexplicable except in terms of its whole of what is life a part lingman asked this question in its present form admits of no answer questioner is still considering life from his personal limited bias answer it in your own terms then moran said the answerer can only answer questions answerer thought again of the sad limitation imposed by his builders silence is the universe expanding moran asked confidently expansion is a term inapplicable to the situation universe as the questioner views it is an illusory concept can you tell us anything moran asked i can answer any valid question concerning the nature of things the two men looked at each other i think i know what he means lingman said sadly our basic assumptions are wrong all of them they can't be moran said physics biology partial truths lingman said with a great weariness in his voice at least we've determined that much we have found out that our inferences concerning observed phenomena are wrong but the rule of the simplest hypotheses it's only a theory lingman said life he certainly could answer what life is look at it this way lingman said suppose you were to ask why was i born under the constellation scorpio in conjunction with saturn i would be unable to answer your question in terms of the zodiac because the zodiac has nothing to do with it i see moran said slowly he can't answer questions in terms of our assumptions that seems to be the case and he can't alter our assumptions he is limited to valid questions which imply it would seem a knowledge we just don't have we can't even ask a valid question moran asked i don't believe that we must know some basics he turned to answer her. what is death I cannot explain an anthropomorphism. Death and anthropomorphism, Moran said, and Lingman turned quickly. Now we're getting somewhere. Are anthropomorphisms unreal? he asked. Anthropomorphisms may be classified tentatively as A, false truths, or B, partial truths, in terms of a partial situation which is applicable here both that was the closest they got moran was unable to draw any more from answerer for hours the two men tried but truth was slipping farther and farther away it's maddening moran said after a while this thing has the answer to the whole universe and he can't tell us unless we ask the right question but how are we supposed to know the right question lingman sat on the ground leaning against a stone wall he closed his eyes savages that's what we are moran said pacing up and down in front of answerer 
Imagine a bushman walking up to a physicist and asking him why he can't shoot his arrow into the sun. The scientist can explain it only in his own terms. What would happen? The scientist wouldn't even attempt it, Lingman said. In a dim voice, he would know the limitations of the questioner. It's fine, Moran said angrily. How do you explain the Earth's rotation to a bushman? Or better, how do you explain relativity to him, maintaining scientific rigor in your explanation at all times, of course? Lingman, eyes closed, didn't answer. We're bushmen, but the gap is much greater here. Worm and Superman, perhaps. The worm desires to know the nature of dirt, and why there's so much of it. Oh, well. Shall we go, sir? Moran asked. Lingman's eyes remained closed. His taloned fingers were clenched. His cheeks sunk further in. The skull was emerging. Sir! Sir! An answerer knew that that was not the answer. Alone on his planet, which is neither large nor small, but exactly the right size, answerer waits. He cannot help the people who come to him, for even answerer has restrictions. He can answer only valid questions. Universe, life, death, purple, eighteen, partial truths, half-truths, little bits of the great question. But answerer alone mumbles the questions to himself, the true questions which no one can understand. How could they understand the true answers? The questions will never be asked. An answerer remembers something his builders knew and forgot. In order to ask a question, you must already know most of the answer. End of Ask a Foolish Question by Robert Sheckley Diplomatic Immunity by Robert Sheckley this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Dale Grothman. Diplomatic Immunity by Robert Checkley. He said he wasn't immortal, but nothing could kill him. Still, if the earth was to live as a free world, he had to die. Come right in, gentlemen. The ambassador waved them into the very special suite the State Department had given him. Please, be seated. Colonel Searcy accepted a chair, trying to size up the individual who had all Washington chewing its fingernails. The ambassador hardly looked like a menace. He was of medium height and slight build, dressed in a conservative brown tweed suit that the State Department had given him. His face was intelligent, finely molded and aloof. As human as human, Circe thought, studying the alien with bleak, impersonal eyes. How may I serve you? the ambassador asked, smiling. The president has put me in charge of your case, Circe said. I've studied Professor Derrick's reports, he nodded at the scientist beside him. But I'd like to hear the whole thing for myself. Of course, the alien said, lighting a cigarette. He seemed genuinely pleased to be asked which was interesting, Circe thought. In the week since he'd landed, every important scientist in the country had been at him. But in a pinch they called the army, Circe reminded himself. He settled back in his chair, both hands jammed carelessly into his pockets. His right hand was resting on the butt of a forty-five, the safety off. I have come, the alien said, as an ambassador at large representing an empire that stretches halfway across the galaxy. I wish to extend the welcome of my people, and to invite you to join our organization. I see, Circe replied. Some of the scientists got the impression that participation was compulsory. You will join, the ambassador said, blowing smoke through his nostrils. Circe could see Derrick stiffen in his chair and bite his lip. Circe moved the automatic to a position where he could draw it easily. How did you find us? he asked. We ambassadors at large are assigned an unexplored section of space, the alien said. 
we examine each star system in the region for planets and each planet for intelligent life intelligent life is rare in the galaxy you know Cersei nodded although he hadn't been aware of the fact when we find such a planet we land as I did and prepare the inhabitants for their part in our organization how will your people know when you have found intelligent life Cersei asked there is a sending mechanism that is part of our structure the ambassador answered it is triggered when we reach an inhabited planet this signal is beamed continuously into space to an effective range of several thousand light years follow-up crews are continually sweeping through the limits of the reception area of each ambassador listening for such messages detecting one a colonization team follows it to the planet he tapped his cigarette delicately on the edge of the ashtray this method has definite advantages over sending combined colonization and exploration teams obviously it avoids the necessity of equipping large forces for what may be decades of searching sure Cersei's face was expressionless would you tell me more about this message there isn't much more you need to know the beam is not detectable by your methods and therefore cannot be jammed the message continues as long as I am alive Derek drew in his breath sharply and glanced at Cersei if you stopped broadcasting Cersei said casually our planet would never be found not until this section of space is resurveyed the diplomat agreed very well as the duly appointed representative of the President of the United States I ask you to stop transmitting we don't choose to become part of your Empire I'm sorry the ambassador said he shrugged his shoulders easily Cersei wondered how many times he had played this scene on how many other planets there's really nothing I can do he stood up then you won't stop I can't I have no control over the sending once it's activated the diplomat turned and walked to the window however I have prepared a philosophy for you it is my duty as your ambassador to ease the shock of transition as much as possible this philosophy will make it instantly apparent that as the ambassador reached the window Cersei's gun was out of his pocket and roaring he squeezed six rounds in almost a single explosion aiming at the ambassador's head and back then an uncontrollable shudder ran through him the ambassador was no longer there Cersei and Derrick stared at each other Derek muttered something about ghosts then just as suddenly the ambassador was back you didn't think he said that it would be as easy as all that did you we ambassadors have necessarily a certain diplomatic immunity he fingered one of the bullet holes in the wall in case you don't understand let me put it this way it is not in your power to kill me you couldn't even understand the nature of my defense he looked at them and in that moment Cersei felt the ambassador's complete alienness good day gentlemen he said Derrick and Cersei walked silently back to the control room neither had really expected that the ambassador would be killed so easily but it had still been a shock when the slugs had failed I suppose you saw it all Mally Cersei asked when he reached the control room the thin balding psychiatrist nodded sadly got it on film too I wonder what his philosophy is Derek mused half to himself it was illogical to expect it would work no race would send an ambassador with a message like that and expect him to live through it unless unless what unless he had a pretty effective defense the psychiatrist finished unhappily Cersei walked across the room and looked at the video panel the ambassador's suite was very special it had been hurriedly constructed two days after he had landed and delivered his message the suite was steel and lead lined filled with video and movie cameras recorders and a variety of other things it was the last word in elaborate death cells in the screen Cersei could see the ambassador sitting at a table he was typing on a little portable the government had given him hey Harrison Cersei called 
Might as well go ahead with plan two. Harrison came out of a side room where he had been examining the circuits leading to the ambassador's suite. Methodically, he checked his pressure gauges, set the controls, and looked at Cersei. Now, he asked. Now, Cersei watched the screen. The ambassador was still typing. Suddenly, as Harrison sent home the switch, the room was engulfed in flames. Fire blasted out of concealed holes in the walls, poured from the ceiling and floor. In a moment, the room was like the inside of a blast furnace. Cersei let it burn for two minutes, then motioned Harrison to cut the switch. They stared at the roasted room. They were looking, hopefully, for a charred corpse, but the ambassador reappeared beside his desk, looking ruefully at the charred typewriter. He was completely unsinged. Could you get me another typewriter? he asked, looking directly at one of the hidden projectors. I'm setting down a philosophy for you ungrateful wretches. He seated himself in the wreckage of an armchair. In a moment, he was apparently asleep. All right, everyone grab a seat, Cersei said. Time for a council of war. Mally straddled a chair backwards. Harrison lighted a pipe as he sat down, slowly puffing it into life. Now then, Cersei said, the government has dropped this squarely in our laps. We have to kill the ambassador, obviously. I've been put in charge. Cersei grinned with regret, probably because no one higher up wants the responsibility of failure and I've selected you three as my staff. We can have anything we want, any assistance or advice we need. All right. Any ideas? How about Plan 3? Harrison asked. We'll get to that, Cersei said, but I don't believe it's going to work. I don't either, Derek agreed. We don't even know the nature of his defense. That's our first order of business. Mally, take all our data so far, and get someone to feed it into the Dirichman analyzer. You know the stuff we want. What property has X if X can do thus and thus? Right, Mally said. He left, muttering something about the ascendancy of the physical sciences. Harrison, Cersei said, is Plan 3 set up? Sure. Give it a try. While Harrison was making his last adjustments, Cersei watched Derek. The plump little physicist was staring thoughtfully into space, muttering to himself. Cersei hoped he would come up with something. He was expecting great things of Derrick. Knowing the impossibility of working with great numbers of people, Cersei had picked his staff with care. Quality was what he wanted. With that in mind, he chose Harrison first. The stocky, sour-faced engineer had a reputation for being able to build anything given half an idea how it worked. Cersei had selected Mally, the psychiatrist, because he wasn't sure that killing the ambassador was going to be a purely physical problem. Derrick was a mathematical physicist, but his restless, curious mind had come up with some interesting theories in other fields. He was the only one of the four who was really interested in the ambassador as an intellectual problem. He's like metal old man, Derrick said finally. What's that? Haven't you ever heard the story of Metal Old Man? Well, he was a monster covered with black metal armor. He was met by a Monster Slayer, an Apache culture hero. Monster Slayer, after many attempts, finally killed Metal Old Man. How did he do it? Shot him in the armpit. He didn't have any armor there. Fine, Cersei grinned. Ask our ambassador to raise his arms. All set, Harrison called. Fine. Go. In the ambassador's room, an invisible spray of gamma rays silently began to flood the room with deadly radiation. But there was no ambassador to receive them. That's enough, Cersei said after a while. That would kill a herd of elephants. But the ambassador stayed invisible for five hours, until some of the radioactivity had abated. Then he appeared again. I'm still waiting for the typewriter, he said. Here's the analyst's report. Mally handed Cersei a sheaf of paper. This is the final formulation, boiled down. Cersei read it aloud. The simplest defense against any and all weapons is to become each particular weapon. 
Great, Harrison said. What does it mean? It means, Derek explained, that when we attack the ambassador with fire, he turns into fire. Shoot at him, and he turns into a bullet, until the menace is gone, and then he changes back again. He took the papers out of Cersei's hand and riffled through them. Hmm. Wonder if there's any historical parallel. Don't suppose so. He raised his head. Although this isn't conclusive, it seems logical enough. Any other defense would involve recognition of the weapon first, then an appraisal, and then a counter-move predicated on the potentialities of the weapon. The ambassador's defense would be a lot faster and safer. He wouldn't have to recognize the weapon. I suppose his body simply identifies in some way with the menace at hand. Did the analyzer say there was any way of breaking his defense? Cersei asked. The analyzer stated definitely that there was no way if the premise were true, Mally answered gloomily. We can discard that judgment, Derek said. The machine is limited. But we still haven't got any way to stop him, Mally pointed out, and he's still broadcasting that beam. Cersei thought for a moment. Call in every expert you can find. We're going to throw the book at the ambassador. I know, he said, looking at Derek's dubious expression, but we have to try. During the next few days, every combination and permutation of death was thrown at the ambassador. He was showered with weapons, ranging from Stone Age axes to modern high-powered rifles, peppered with hand grenades, drowned in acid, suffocated in poison gas. He kept shrugging his shoulders philosophically and continued to work on the new typewriter they had given him. Bacteria was piped in, first the known germ diseases, then mutated species. The diplomat didn't even sneeze. He was showered with electricity, radiation, wooden weapons, iron weapons, copper weapons, brass weapons, uranium weapons, anything and everything, just to cover all possibilities. He didn't suffer a scratch, but his room looked as though a barroom brawl had been going on continually for fifty years. Mally was working on an idea of his own, as was Derek. The physicist interrupted himself long enough to remind Circe of the Baldur myth. Baldur had been showered with every kind of weapon and remained unscathed, because everything on earth had promised to love him. Everything except the mistletoe. When a little twig of it was shot at him, he died. Circe turned away impatiently, but had an order of mistletoe set up just in case. It was, at least, no less effective than the explosive shells or the bow and arrow. It did nothing except lend an oddly festive air to the battered room. After a week of this, they moved the unprotesting ambassador into a newer, bigger, stronger death cell. They were unable to venture into his old one because of the radioactivity and microorganisms. The ambassador went back to work at his typewriter. All his previous attempts had been burned, torn, or eaten away. Let's go talk to him, Derek suggested, after another day had passed. Cersei agreed. For the moment, they were out of ideas. Come right in, gentlemen, the ambassador said, so cheerfully that Cersei felt sick. I'm sorry I can't offer you anything. Through an oversight, I haven't been given any food or water for about ten days. Not that it matters, of course. Glad to hear it, Cersei said. The ambassador hardly looked as if he had been facing all the violence Earth had to offer. On the contrary, Cersei and his men looked as though they had been under bombardment. "'You've got quite a defense there,' Mally said conversationally. "'Glad you like it.' "'Would you mind telling us how it works?' Derek asked innocently. "'Don't you know?' "'We think so. You become what is attacking you. Is that right?' Certainly, the ambassador said. You see, I have no secrets from you. Is there anything we can give you, Cersei asked, to get you to turn off that signal? A bribe? Sure, Cersei said. Anything you... Nothing, the ambassador replied. Look, be reasonable, Harrison said. You don't want to cause a war, do you? Earth is united now. We're arming. With what? 
Atomic bombs, Mally answered him. Hydrogen bombs. We've... Drop one on me, the ambassador said. It won't kill me. What makes you think it will have any effect on my people? The four men were silent. Somehow they hadn't thought of that. A people's ability to make war, the ambassador stated, is a measure of the status of their civilization. Stage one is the use of simple physical extensions. Stage two is control at a molecular level. You are on the threshold of stage three, although still far from mastery of the atomic and subatomic forces. He smiled ingratiatingly. My people are reaching the limits of stage five. What would that be? Derek asked. You'll find out, the ambassador said, but perhaps you're wondering if my powers are typical. I don't mind telling you that they're not. In order for me to do my job, and nothing more, I have certain built-in restrictions, making me capable only of passive action. Why? Derek asked. For obvious reasons. If I were to take a positive action in a moment of anger, I might destroy your entire planet. Do you expect us to believe that? Cersei asked. Why not? Is it so hard to understand? Can't you believe that there are forces you know nothing about? And there is another reason for my passiveness. Certainly by this time you've deduced it. To break our spirit, I suppose, Cersei said. Exactly. My telling you won't make any difference either. The pattern is always the same. An ambassador lands and delivers his message to a high-spirited, wild young race like yours. There is frenzied resistance against him, spasmodic attempts to kill him. After all these fail, the people are usually quite crestfallen. When the colonization team arrives, their indoctrination goes along just that much faster. He paused, then said, most planets are more interested in the philosophy I have to offer. I assure you, it will make the transition far easier. He held out a sheaf of typewritten pages. Won't you at least look through it? Derek accepted the papers and put them in his pocket. When I get time. I suggest you give it a try, the ambassador said. You must be near the crisis point now. Why not give up? Not yet, Cersei replied tonelessly. Don't forget to read the philosophy, the ambassador urged them. The men hurried from the room. Now look, Mally said once they were back in the control room. There are a few things we haven't tried. How about utilizing psychology? Anything you like, Cersei agreed, including black magic. What do you have in mind? The way I see it, Mally answered. The ambassador is geared to respond instantaneously to any threat. He must have an all-or-nothing defensive reflex. I suggest first that we try something that won't trigger that reflex. Like what? Cersei asked. Hypnotism. Perhaps we can find out something. Sure, Cersei said. Try it. Try anything. Cersei, Mally, and Derek gathered around the video screen as an infinitesimal amount of light hypnotic gas was admitted into the ambassador's room. At the same time, a bolt of electricity lashed into the chair where the ambassador was sitting. That was to distract him, Mally explained. The ambassador vanished before the electricity struck him, and then appeared again, curled up in his armchair. That's enough, Mally whispered, and shut the valve. They watched. After a while, the ambassador put down his book and stared into the distance. How strange, he said. Alfred dead. Good friend. Just a freak accident. He ran into it out there. Didn't have a chance. But it doesn't happen often. He's thinking out loud, Mally whispered, although there was no possibility of the ambassador's hearing them. Vocalizing his thoughts. His friend must have been on his mind for some time. Of course, the ambassador went on. 
Alfred had to die sometime. No immortality, yet. But that way. No defense. Out there in space they just pop up. Always there, underneath. Just waiting for a chance to boil out. His body isn't reacting to the hypnotic as a menace yet, Cersei whispered. Well, the ambassador told himself, the regularizing principle has been doing pretty well, keeping it all down, smoothing out the inconsistencies. Suddenly he leapt to his feet, his face pale for a moment, as he obviously tried to remember what he had said. Then he laughed. Clever. That's the first time that particular trick has been played on me, and the last time. But, gentlemen, it didn't do you any good. I don't know myself how to go about killing me. He laughed at the blank walls. Besides, he continued, the colonizing team must have the direction now. They'll find you with or without me. He sat down again, smiling. That does it, Garrick cried. He's not invulnerable. Something killed his friend, Alfred. Something out in space, Cersei reminded him. I wonder what it was. Let me see, Derrick reflected aloud. The regularizing principle. That must be a natural law we knew nothing about. And underneath. What would be underneath? He said the colonization team would find us anyhow, Mally reminded them. First things first, Cersei said. He might have been bluffing us. No, I don't suppose so. We still have to get the ambassador out of the way. I think I know what is underneath, Derek exclaimed. This is wonderful. A new cosmology, perhaps. What is it, Cersei asked. Anything we can use? I think so. But let me work it out. I think I'll go back to my hotel. I have some books there I want to check, and I don't want to be disturbed for a few hours. All right, Cersei agreed. But what? No, no, I could be wrong, Derek said. Let me work it out. He hurried from the room. What do you think he's driving at? Mally asked. Beats me, Cersei shrugged. Come on, let's try some more of that psychology stuff. First, they filled the ambassador's room with several feet of water. Not enough to drown him, just enough to make him good and uncomfortable. To this, they added the lights. For eight hours, lights flashed in the ambassador's room. Bright lights to pry under his eyelids. Dull, clashing ones to disturb him. Sound came next. Screeches and screams and shrill grating noises. The sound of a man's fingernails being dragged across slate amplified a thousand times, and strange sucking noises, and shouts, and whispers. Then the smells, then everything else they could think of that could drive a man insane. The ambassador slept peacefully through it all. Now look, Cersei said the following day, let's start using our damned heads. His voice was hoarse and rough. Although the psychological torture hadn't bothered the ambassador, it seemed to have backfired on Cersei and his men. Where in hell is Derek? Still working on that idea of his, Mally said, rubbing his stubble chin. Says he's just about got it. We'll work on the assumption that he can't produce, Cersei said. Start thinking. For example, if the ambassador can turn into anything, what is there that he can't turn into? Good question, Harrison grunted. It's the payoff question, Cersei said. No use throwing a spear at a man who can turn into one. How about this, Mally asked. Taking it for granted he can turn into anything, how about putting him in a situation where he'll be attacked even after he alters? I'm listening, Cersei said. Say he's in danger. He turns into the thing threatening him. What if that thing were itself being threatened? and in turn was in the act of threatening something else what would he do then how are you going to put that into action cersei asked like this mally picked up the telephone hello give me the washington zoo this is urgent the ambassador turned as the door opened 
an unwilling angry hungry tiger was propelled in the door slammed shut the tiger looked at the ambassador the ambassador looked at the tiger most ingenious the ambassador said at the sound of his voice the tiger came unglued he sprang like a steel spring uncoiling landing on the floor where the ambassador had been the door opened again another tiger was pushed in he snarled angrily and leaped at the first they smashed together in mid-air the ambassador appeared a few feet off watching he moved back when the lion entered the door head up and alert the lion sprang at him almost going over on his head when he struck nothing not finding any human the lion leapt on one of the tigers the ambassador reappeared in his chair where he sat smoking and watching the beasts kill each other in ten minutes the room looked like an abattoir but by then the ambassador had tired of the spectacle and was reclining on his bed reading i give up mally said that was my last bright idea Cersei stared at the floor not answering harrison was seated in a corner getting quietly drunk the telephone rang yeah Cersei said i've got it derrick's voice shouted over the line i really think this is it look i'm taking a cab right down tell harrison to find some helpers what is it Cersei asked the chaos underneath garrick replied and hung up they paced the floor waiting for him to show up half an hour passed then an hour finally three hours after he had called derrick strolled in hello he said casually hello hell Cersei growled what kept you on the way over derrick said i read the ambassador's philosophy it's quite a work is that what took you so long yes i had the driver take me around the park a few times while i was reading it skip it how about i can't skip it derrick said in a strange tight voice i'm afraid we were wrong about the aliens i mean it's perfectly right and proper that they should rule us as a matter of fact i wish they'd hurry up and get here but derrick didn't look certain his voice shook and perspiration poured from his face he twisted his hands together as though in agony it's hard to explain he said everything became clear as soon as i started reading it i saw how stupid we were trying to be independent in this interdependent universe i saw oh look Cersei, let's stop all this foolishness and accept the ambassador as our friend calm down Cersei shouted at the perfectly calm physicist you don't know what you're saying it's strange derrick said i know how i felt i just don't feel that way any more i think anyhow i know your trouble you haven't read the philosophy you'll see what i mean once you read it he handed Cersei a pile of papers Cersei promptly ignited them with his cigarette lighter it doesn't matter derrick said i got it memorized just listen axiom one all peoples Cersei hit him a short clean blow and derrick slumped to the floor those words must be semantically keyed mally said they're designed to set off certain reactions in us i suppose all the ambassador does is alter the philosophy to suit the peoples he's dealing with look mally Cersei said this is your job now derrick knows or thought he knew the answer you have to get that out of him that won't be easy mally said he'd feel that he was betraying everything he believes in if he were to tell us i don't care how you get it Cersei said just get it even if it kills him mally asked even if it kills you help me get him to my lab mally said that night Cersei and harrison kept watch on the ambassador from the control room Cersei found his thoughts were racing in circles what had killed alfred in space could it be duplicated on earth what was the regularizing principle what was the chaos underneath what in hell am i doing here he asked himself but he couldn't start that sort of thing what do you figure the ambassador is he asked harrison is he a man looks like one harrison said drowsily but he doesn't act like one 
I wonder if this is his true shape. Harrison shook his head and lighted his pipe. What is there of him? Circe asked. He looks like a man, but he can change into anything else. You can't attack him. He adapts. He's like water, taking the shape of any vessel he's poured into. You can boil water, Harrison yawned. Sure, water hasn't any shape, has it? Or has it? What's basic? With an effort, Harrison tried to focus on Circe's words. Molecular pattern? The matrix? Matrix, Circe repeated, yawning to himself. Pattern. Must be something like that. A pattern is abstract, isn't it? Sure, a pattern can be impressed on anything. What did I say? Let's see, Circe said. Pattern. Matrix. Everything about the ambassador is capable of change. There must be some unifying force that retains his personality. Something that doesn't change no matter what contortions he goes through. Like a piece of string, Harrison murmured, with his eyes closed. Sure, tie it in knots, weave a rope out of it, wind it around your finger, it's still string. Yeah, but how would you attack a pattern, Cersei asked, and why couldn't he get some sleep? To hell with the ambassador and his hordes of colonists. He was going to close his eyes for a moment. Wake up, Colonel. Cersei pried his eyes open and looked up at Mally. Beside him, Harrison was snoring deeply. Did you get anything? Not a thing, Mally confessed. The philosophy must have had quite an effect on him. But it didn't work all the way. Derrick knew that he wanted to kill the ambassador, and for good and sufficient reasons. Although he felt differently now, he still had the feeling that he was betraying us. On the one hand, he couldn't hurt the ambassador. On the other, he wouldn't hurt us. Won't he tell anything? I'm afraid it's not that simple, Mally said. You know, if you have an insurmountable obstacle that must be surmounted, and also I think the philosophy had an injurious effect on his mind, what are you trying to say? Cersei got to his feet. I'm sorry, Mally apologized. There wasn't a damn thing I could do. Derrick fought the whole thing out in his mind, and when he couldn't fight any longer, he retreated. I'm afraid he's hopelessly insane. Let's see him. They walked down the corridor to Mally's laboratory. Derrick was relaxed on a couch, his eyes glazed and staring. Is there any way of curing him? Cersei asked. Shock therapy, maybe. Mally was dubious. It'll take a long time, and he'll probably block out everything that had to do with producing this. Cersei turned away, feeling sick. Even if Derek could be cured, it would be too late. The aliens must have picked up the ambassador's message by now, and were undoubtedly headed for Earth. What's this? Cersei asked picking up a piece of paper that lay by Derrick's hand. Oh, he was doodling, Mally said. Is there anything written on it? Circe read aloud. Upon further consideration, I can see that Chaos and the Gorgon Medusa are closely related. What does that mean? Mally asked. I don't know, Circe puzzled. He was always interested in folklore. Sounds schizophrenic, the psychiatrist said. Circe read it again. Upon further consideration, I can see that Chaos and the Gorgon Medusa are closely related. He stared at it. Isn't it possible, he asked Mally, that he was trying to give us a clue, trying to trick himself into giving and not giving at the same time? It's possible, Mally agreed. An unsuccessful compromise. But what could it mean? Chaos. Circe remembered Derek mentioning that word in his telephone call. That was the original state of the universe in Greek myth, wasn't it? The formlessness out of which everything came? Something like that, Mally said. And Medusa was one of those three sisters with the horrible faces. Circe stood for a moment, staring at the paper. Chaos, Medusa, and the organizing principle. Of course. I think he turned and ran from the room. Mally looked at him, 
then loaded a hypodermic and followed. In the control room, Cersei shouted Harrison into consciousness. Listen, he said, I want you to build me something quick. Do you hear me? Sure, Harrison blinked and sat up. What's the rush? I know what Derek wanted to tell us, Cersei said. Come on, and I'll tell you what I want. And Mally, put down that hypodermic. I haven't cracked. I want you to get me a book on Greek mythology. And hurry it up. Finding a Greek mythology wasn't an easy task at two o'clock in the morning. With the aid of FBI men, Mally routed the book dealer out of bed. He got his book and hurried back. Cersei was red-eyed and excited, and Harrison and his helpers were working away at three crazy-looking rigs. Cersei snatched the book from Mally, looked up one item, and put it down. Great work, he said. We're all set now. Finished, Harrison? Just about. Harrison and the ten helpers were screwing in the last parts. Will you tell me what this is? Me too, Mally put in. I don't mean to be secretive, Cersei said. I'm just in a hurry. I'll explain as we go along. He stood up. Okay, let's wake up the ambassador. They watched the screen as a bolt of electricity leapt from the ceiling to the ambassador's bed. Immediately, the ambassador vanished. Now he's part of a stream of electrons, right? Cersei asked. That's what he told us, Mally said. But still keeping his pattern within the stream, Cersei continued. He has to in order to get back into his own shape. Now we start the first disruptor. Harrison hooked the machine into circuit and sent his helpers away. Here's a running graph of the electron stream, Cersei said. See the difference? On the graph there was an irregular series of peaks and valleys, constantly shifting and leveling. Do you remember when you hypnotized the ambassador? He talked about his friend who'd been killed in space. That's right, Mally nodded. His friend had been killed by something that had just popped up. He said something else, Cersei went on. He told us that the basic organizing force of the universe usually stops things like that. What does that mean to you? The organizing force, Mally repeated slowly. Didn't Derek say that was a new natural law? He did. But think of the implications, as Derek did. If an organizing principle is engaged in some work, there must be something that opposes it. That which opposes organization is chaos. That's what Derek thought, and what we should have seen. The chaos is underlying, and out of it there arose an organizing principle. This principle, if I got it right, sought to suppress the fundamental chaos and make all things regular. But chaos still boils out in spots, as Alfred found out. Perhaps the organizational pattern is weaker in space. Anyhow, these spots are dangerous until the organizing principle gets to work on them. He turned to the panel. Okay, Harrison, throw in the second disruptor. The peaks and valleys altered on the graph. They started to mount in crazy, meaningless configurations. Take Derek's message in the light of that. Chaos, we know, is underlying. Everything was formed out of it. The Gorgon Medusa was something that couldn't be looked upon. She turned men into stone, you recall, destroying them. So Derrick found a relationship between chaos and that which can't be looked upon. All with regard to the ambassador, of course. The ambassador can't look upon chaos, Mally cried. That's it. The ambassador is capable of an infinite number of alterations and permutations, but something, the matrix, can't change, because then there would be nothing left. To destroy something as abstract as a pattern, we need a state in which no pattern is possible, a state of chaos. The third disruptor was thrown into circuit. The graph looked as if a drunken caterpillar had been sketching on it. Those disruptors are Harrison's idea, Cersei said. I told him I wanted an electrical circuit with absolutely no coherent pattern. The disruptors are an extension of radio jamming. The first alters the electrical pattern. That's its purpose, to produce a state of patternlessness. The second tries to destroy the pattern left by the first. The third tries to destroy the pattern made by the first two. 
They're fed back then, and any remaining pattern is systematically destroyed in circuit, I hope. This is supposed to produce a state of chaos? Mally asked, looking into the screen. For a while, there was only the whining of machines and the crazy doodling of the graph. Then, in the middle of the ambassador's room, a spot appeared. It wavered, shrunk, expanded. What happened was indescribable. All they knew was everything within the spot had disappeared. Switch it off, Cersei shouted. Harrison cut the switch. The spot continued to grow. How is it that we're able to look at it? Mally asked, staring at the screen. The shield of Perseus, remember? Cersei said. Using it as a mirror, he looked at Medusa. It's still growing, Mally shouted. There was a calculated risk in all of this, Cersei said. There's always a possibility that chaos may go on unchecked. If that happens, it won't really matter what. The spot stopped growing. Its edges wavered and rippled, and then it started to shrink. The organizing principle, Cersei said, and collapsed into a chair. Any sign of the ambassador? he asked in a few minutes. The spot was still wavering. Then it was gone. Instantly there was an explosion. The steel walls buckled inward, but held. The screen went dead. The spot removed all the air from the room, Cersei explained, as well as the furniture and the ambassador. He couldn't take it, Mally said. No pattern can cohere in a state of patternlessness. He's gone to join Alfred. Mally started to giggle. Cersei felt like joining him, but pulled himself together. Take it easy, he said. We're not through yet. Sure we are. The ambassador is out of the way. But there's still an alien fleet homing in on this region of space. A fleet so strong we can't scratch it with an H-bomb. They'll be looking for us. He stood up. Go home and get some sleep. Something tells me that tomorrow we're going to have to start figuring out some way of camouflaging a planet. The End of Diplomatic Immunity by Robert Sheckley Read by Dale Grothman This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Operation Distress by Lester Del Rey. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dale Grothman. Operation Distress by Lester Del Rey. Explorers who dread spiders and snakes prove that heroism is always more heroic to outsiders. Then there's the case of the first space pilot to Mars, who developed an itch. Bill Adams was halfway back from Mars when he noticed the red rash on his hands. He'd been reaching for one of the few remaining tissues to cover a sneeze, while scratching vigorously at the base of his neck. Then he saw the red spot, and his hands halted, while all desire to sneeze gasped out of him. He sat there five feet seven inches of lean muscle and bronzed skin, sweating and staring, while the blonde hair on the back of his neck seemed to stand on end. Finally he dropped his hand and pulled himself carefully erect. The cabin in the spaceship was big enough to permit turning around, but not much more. And with the ship cruising without power, there was almost no gravity to keep him from overshooting his goal. He found the polished plate that served as a mirror, and studied himself. His eyes were puffy, his nose was red, and there were other red splotches and marks on his face. Whatever it was, he had it bad. Pictures went through his head, all unpleasant. 
He'd been only a kid when the men came back from the South Pacific in the last war, but an uncle had spent years dying of some weird disease that the doctors couldn't identify. That had been from something caught on Earth. What would happen when a disease was from another planet? It was ridiculous. Mars had no animal life and even the thin lichen-like plants were sparse and thin. A man couldn't catch a disease from a plant. Even horses don't communicate their ills to man. Then Bill remembered gangrene and cancer, which could attack any life, apparently. He went back to the tiny Geiger Mueller counter, but there was no sign of radiation from the big atomic motor that powered the ship. He stripped his clothes off, spotting more of the red marks breaking out but finding no sign of parasites. He hadn't really believed it, anyhow. That wouldn't account for the sneezing and sniffles, or the puffy eyes and burning inside his nose and throat. Dust, maybe. Mars had been dusty, a waste of reddish sand and desert silt that made the Sahara seem like a paradise, and it had settled on his spacesuit to come in through the airlocks with him. But if it contained some irritant, it should have been worse on Mars than now. He could remember nothing annoying. And he turned on the tiny, compact little static dust traps, in any case, before leaving, to clear the air. He went back to one of the traps now, and ripped the cover off. The little motor purred briskly. The plastic rods turned against the fur brushes, while a wiper cleared off any dust they picked up. There was no dust he could see. The traps had done their work. Some plant irritant, like poison ivy? No, he'd always worn his suit. Mars had an atmosphere, but it wasn't anything a man could breathe long. The suit was put on and off with automatic machine grapples, so he couldn't have touched it. The rash seemed to get worse on his body as he looked at it. This time he tore one of the tissues in quarters as he sneezed. The little supply was almost gone. There was never space enough for much beyond essentials in a spaceship, even with the new atomic drive. As he looked for spots, the burning in his nose seemed to increase. He dropped back into the pilot seat, cursing. Two months of being cramped up in this cubicle, sweating out the trip to Mars without knowing how the new engines would last. Three weeks on Mars mapping frantically to cover all the territory he could, and planting little flags a hundred miles apart. Now a week on the trip back, at high acceleration most of the way. And this. He'd expected adventure of some kind. Mars, though, had proved to be as interesting as a sand pile, and even the canals had proved to be only mineral striations invisible from the ground. He looked for something to do, but found nothing. He developed his films the day before, after carefully cleaning the static traps to make sure the air was dust-free. He'd written up the accounts, and he'd been coasting along on the hope of getting home to a bath, a beer, and a few bull sessions, before he began to capitalize on being the first man to reach another planet beyond the moon. He cut on full acceleration again, more certain of his motors than of himself. He'd begun to notice the itching yesterday. Today he was breaking out in the rash. How long would whatever was coming take? Good God, he might die from something as humiliating and undramatic as this. It hadn't hit him before, fully. There was no knowing about diseases from other planets. Men had developed immunity to the germs found on Earth. But just as smallpox had proven so fatal to the Indians, and syphilis to Europe when they first hit, there was no telling how wildly this might progress. It might go away in a day, or it might kill him just as quickly. He was figuring his new orbit on a tiny calculator. In two days, at this acceleration, he could reach radar distance from Earth. In four, he could land. The tubes might burn out in the continuous firing, but the other way he'd be two weeks making a landing, and most diseases he could remember seemed faster than that. Bill wiped the sweat off his forehead, scratched at other places that were itching, and stared down at the small disk of earth. 
there were doctors there and brother he needed them fast things were a little worse when the first squeals came from the radar two days later he'd run out of tissues his nose was a continual drip while breathing seemed almost impossible he was running some fever too though he had no way of knowing how much he cut his receiver in punching out the code on his keys the receiver pipped again at him bits of message coming through but unclearly there was no response to his signals he checked his chronometer and flipped over the micro pages of his ephemeris the big radar at washington was still out of line with him and the signals had to cut through too much air to come clearly it should be good in another hour but right now an hour seemed longer than a normal year he checked the dust tray again tried to figure out other orbits managed to locate the moon and scratched fifteen minutes there was no room for pacing up and down he pushed the back down on the pilot seat lowered the table and pulled out his bunk he remade it to make sure all the corners were perfect then he folded it back and lifted the table and the seat that took less than five minutes his hands were shaking worse when the automatic radar signals began to come through more clearly it wasn't an hour but he could wait no longer he opened the key and began to send it would take fifteen seconds for the signal to reach earth and another quarter minute for an answer even if the operator was on duty half a minute later he found one earth to mars rocket one thank god you're ahead of schedule if your tubes hold out crowd them two other nations have ships out now the u.n has ruled that whoever comes back first with the mapping surveys can claim the territory mapped we're rushing construction but we need the ship for a second run if we're to claim our fair territory ah hell congratulations he started hammering at his keys before they finished giving the facts on the tubes which were standing up beyond all expectations and get a doctor ready a bunch of them he finished i seem to have picked up something like a disease there was a long delay before the answer came this time more than five minutes the hand on the key was obviously different slower and not as steady what symptoms adams give all details he began giving all the information he had from the first itching through the rash and the fever again longer this time the main station hesitated anything i can do about it now bill asked finally and how about having those doctors ready we're checking with medical the signal answered we're here's their report not enough data could be anything dozens of diseases like that nothing you can do except try saltwater gargling and spray you've got stuff for that wash off rash with soap and hot water followed by some of your hypo we'll get medical kit up to the moon for you he let that sink in then clicked back the moon you think you can land here with whatever you've got man there's no way of knowing how contagious it is and keep an hourly check with us if you pass out we'll try to get someone out in a moon rocket to pick you up but we can't risk danger of infecting the whole planet you're quarantined on the moon we'll send up landing instructions later not even for luna base but where there will be no chance of contamination for others you didn't really expect to come back here did you adams he should have thought it through he knew that and he knew that the words from earth weren't as callous as they sounded down there men would be sweating with him going crazy trying to do something but they were right earth had to be protected first bill adams was only one out of two and a half billions even if he had reached a planet before any other man yeah it was fine to be a hero but heroes shouldn't menace the rest of the world logically he knew they were right that helped him get his emotions under control 
Where do you want me to put down? Tycho, it isn't hard to spot for radar-controlled delivery of supplies to you, but it's a good 700 miles from Lunar Base. And look, we'll try to get a doctor to you, but keep us informed if anything slips. We need those maps, if you can find a way to sterilize them. Okay, he acknowledged, and tell the cartographers that there are no craters, no intelligence, and only plants about a half an inch high. Mars stinks. They'd already been busy, he saw, as he teetered down on his jets for a landing on Tycho. Holding control was the hardest job he'd ever done. A series of itchings cropped out just as the work got tricky, when he could no longer see the surface, and had to go by feel. But somehow he made it. Then he relaxed and began an orgy of scratching, and he'd thought there was something romantic about being a hero. The supplies that had already been sent up by the super-fast unmanned missiles would give him something to do, at least. He moved back the two feet needed to reach his developing tanks, and went through the process of spraying and gargling. It was soothing enough while it went on, but it offered only momentary help. Then his stomach began showing distress signs. He fought against it, tightening up. It did no good. His hasty breakfast, of just black coffee, wanted to come up, and it did, giving him barely time to make the little booth. He washed his mouth out and grabbed for the radar key, banging out a report on this. The doctors must have been standing by down at the big station, because there was only a slight delay before the answering signal came. Any blood? Another knot added itself to his intestines. I don't know. Don't think so. But I didn't look. Look next time. We're trying to get this related to some of the familiar diseases. It must have some relation. There are only so many ways a man can be sick. We've got a doctor coming over, Adams. None on the moon. But we've shipped him through. He'll set down in about nine hours. And there's some stuff to take on the supply missiles. May not help, but we're trying a mixture of antibiotics. Also some ACS and anodynes for the itching and rash. Hope they work. Let us know any reaction. Bill cut off. He'd have to try. They were as much in the dark about this as he was, but they had a better background for guessing and trial and error. If the bugs in him happened to be like tracheomycidin, he wouldn't be too much worse off. Damn it! Had there been blood? He forced his mind off it, climbing into his clothes, and then into the spacesuit that hung from the grapples. It moved automatically into position, the two halves sliding shut and sealing from the outside. The big gloves on his hands were too clumsy for such operations. Then he went bounding across the moon. Halfway to the supplies, he felt the itching coming back. He slithered and wiggled around, trying to scratch his skin inside his clothing. It didn't help much. He was sweating harder, and his eyes were watering. He manipulated the little visor-cleaning gadget, trying to poke his face forward to brush the frustration tears from his eyes. He couldn't quite reach it. There were three supply missiles, each holding about two hundred pounds earth weight. He tied them together and slung them over his back, heading toward his ship. Here they weighed only about a hundred pounds, and with his own weight and the suit added, the whole load came to a little more than his normal weight on earth. He tried to shift the supplies around on his back, getting them to press against the spots of torment as he walked. It simply unbalanced him without really relieving the itch. Fortunately, though, his eyes were clearing a little. He gritted his teeth and fought back through the powdery pumice surface, kicking up clouds of dust that settled slowly, but completely. Though the gravity was low, there was no air to hold them up. Nothing had ever looked better than the airlock of the ship. He let the grapples hook the suit off him as soon as the outer seal was shut, and went into a whirling dervish act. Aches and pains could be stood, but itching. Apparently, though, 
The spray and gargle had helped a little, since his nose felt somewhat clearer, and his eyes were definitely better. He repeated them, and then found the medical supplies, with a long list of instructions. They were really shooting the pharmacy at him. He injected himself, swallowed things, rubbed himself down with others, and waited. Whatever they'd given him didn't offer any immediate help. He began to feel worse. But on contacting Earth by radar, he was assured that that might be expected. We've got another missile coming, with metal foils for the maps and photos, plus a small copying camera. You can print them right on the metal, seal that in a can, and leave it for the rocket that's bringing the doctor. The pilot will blast over it. That should sterilize it, and pick it up when it cools. Bill swore, but he was in his suit when the missile landed, heading out across the pumice-covered wastes toward it. The salve had helped the itching a little, but not much, and his nose had grown worse again. He jockeyed the big supply can out of the torpedo-shaped missile, packed it on his back, and headed for his ship. The itching was acting up as he sweated. This made a real load, about like packing a hundred bulky pounds over his normal earth weight through the soft drift of pumice. But his nose was clearing again. It was apparently becoming cyclic. He'd have to relay that information back to the medics. And where were they getting a doctor crazy enough to take a chance with him? He climbed out of the suit and went through the ritual of scratching, noticing that his fever had gone up, and that his muscles were shaking. His head seemed light, as if he were in a spell of dizziness. They'd be interested in that back on Earth, though it wouldn't do much good. He couldn't work up a clinical attitude about himself. All he wanted was a chance to get over this disease before it killed him. He dragged out the photo and copying equipment under a red light. It filled what little space was left in his cubbyhole cabin. Then he swore, gulped down more pills where they were waiting for him. The metal sheets were fine. They were excellent. The only thing wrong was that they wouldn't fit his developing trays, and they were tough enough to give him no way of cutting them to size. He stuffed them back in their container and shoved it into the airlock. Then his stomach kicked up again. He didn't see any blood in the result, but he couldn't be sure. The color of the pills might hide traces. He flushed it down, his head turning in circles, and went to the radar. This time he didn't even wait for a reply. Let them worry about their damn maps. They could send cutting equipment with the doctor and pick up the things later. They could pick up his corpse and cremate it at the same time, for all he cared right now. He yanked out his bunk and slumped into it, curling up as much as the itching would permit. And finally, for the first time in over fifty hours, he managed to doze off, though his sleep was full of nightmares. It was the sound of the bull-throated chemical rocket that brought him out of it. The sound traveled along the surface through the rocks, and up through the metal ship, even without air to carry it. He could feel the rumble of its takeoff later, but he waited long after that for the doctor. There was no knock on the port. Finally he pulled himself up from the bunk, sweating and shaken, and looked out. The doctor was there, or at least a man in a spacesuit was, but somebody had been in a hurry for volunteers, and given the man no basic training at all. The figure would pull itself erect, take a few strides that were all bounce and no progress, and then slide down into the pumice. Moonwalking was tricky until you learned how. Bill sighed, scratching unconsciously, and made his way out to his suit, climbing into it. He paused for a final good scratch, and then the grapples took over. This time he stumbled also as he made his way across the powdery rubble but the other man was making no real progress at all. Bill reached him and touched helmets long enough to issue simple instructions through metal sound conduction. Then he managed to guide the other's steps. There had been accounts of the days of learning spent by the first men on the moon, but it wasn't that bad with an instructor to help. The doctor picked up as they went along. 
Bill's legs were buckling under him by then, and the itches were past endurance. At the end, the doctor was helping him, but somehow they made the ship, and were getting out of the suits, Bill first, then the doctor, using the grapples under Bill's guidance. The doctor was young and obviously scared, but fighting his fear. He had been picked for his smallness to lighten the load on the chemical rocket, and his little face was intent, but he managed a weak grin. Thanks, Adams. I'm Dr. Ames. Ted to you. Get on to that cot. You're about out on your feet. The tests he made didn't take long, but his head was shaking at the conclusion. Your symptoms make no sense, he summarized. I've got a feeling that some are due to one thing, some to another. Maybe we'll have to wait until I come down with it and compare notes. His grin was wry, but Bill was vaguely glad that he wasn't trying any bedside manner. There wasn't much use in thanking the man for volunteering. Ames had known what he was up against, and he might be scared, but his courage was above thanks. What about the maps? Bill asked. They tell you? They've left the cutters outside. I started to bring them. Then the pumice got me. I couldn't stand upright in it. They'll pick up the maps later, but they're important. The competing ships will claim our territory if we don't file first. He knocked the dust off his instruments and wiped his hands. Bill looked down at the bed to see a fine film of moon silt there. They'd been bringing in too much on the suits. It was too fine. The traps weren't getting it fast enough. He got up shakily, moving toward the dust trap that had been running steadily. But now it was out of order, obviously, with the fur brushes worn down until they could generate almost no static against the rod. He groped into the supplies, hoping there would be replacements. Ames caught his arm. Cut it out, Adams. You're in no shape for this. How long since you've eaten? Bill thought it over, his head thick. I had coffee before I landed. Dr. Ames nodded quickly. Vomiting? Dizziness? Tremors? Excess sweating? What did you expect, man? You put yourself under this strain, not knowing what comes next, having to land on an empty stomach, skipping meals, and loading your stomach with pills, and probably no sleep. These symptoms are perfectly normal. He was at the tiny galley equipment, fixing quick food as he spoke, but his face was still sober. He was probably thinking of the same thing that worried Bill. An empty stomach didn't make an itchy rash, the runny nose, and the eyes, and the general misery that had begun the whole thing. He sorted through the stock of replacement parts. A few field sensors, ship wadding, spare gloves, cellophane wrapping gadgets. Then he had it. Ames was over, urging him toward the cot. But he shook him off. Got to get the dust out of here. Dust'll make the itching worse. Moon dust is sharp, Doc. Just install the new brushes. Where are those instructions? Yeah. Insert the cat's fur brushes under the. Cat's fur? Is that what they use, Doc? Sure. It's cheap and generates static electricity. Did you expect sable? Bill took the can of soup and sipped it without tasting or thinking, his hands going toward a fresh place that itched. His nose began running, but he disregarded it. He still felt lousy, but strength was flowing through him, and life was almost good again. He tossed the bunk back into its slot, lifted the pilot stool, and motioned Ames forward. You operate a key. Hell, I'm getting slow. You can contact Luna Base by phone and have them relay. Here. Now tell them I'm blasting off Prado for Earth. I'll be down in four hours with their plans. You're crazy! The words were flat, but there was desperation on the little doctor's face. He glanced about hastily, taking the microphone woodenly. Adams, they'll have an atomic bomb up here to blast you out before you're near Earth. They've got to protect themselves. You can't. B. 
Bill scratched, but there was the beginning of a grin on his face. Nope, I'm not delirious now, though I damn near cracked up. You've figured out half the symptoms. Take a look at those brushes, cat fur brushes, and figure what they'll do to a man who is breathing the air and who is allergic to cats. All I ever had was some jerk in planning who didn't check my medical record with the trip logistics. I never had these symptoms until I unzipped the traps and turned them on. It got better whenever I was in the suit, breathing canned air. We should have known that a man can't catch a disease from plants. The doctor looked at him, and at the fur pieces he'd thrown into the waste bin, and the whiteness ran from his face. He was seeing his own salvation, and the chuckle began weakly, gathering strength as he turned to the microphone. Cat asthma, simple allergy. Who'd figure you'd get that in deep space? But you're right, Bill. It figures. Bill Adams nodded as he reached for the controls, and the tubes began firing, ready to take them back to Earth. Then he caught himself and swung to the doctor. Doc, he said quickly, just to be sure, tell them this isn't to get out. If they'll keep still about it, so will I. He'd make a hell of a hero on earth if people heard of it, and he could use a little hero's reward. No cat calls, thanks. End of Operation Distress by Lester Del Rey This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.